call this message this morning, the cost was too much and they ended up missing the boat. The cost was too much and they ended up missing the boat. You would imagine that anyone alive when Jesus walked this earth would have believed that he was who he said he was and would have embraced him as the Lord of their life. I mean, I often sit and think I would have loved to have lived in Jesus' day. I would love to have watched him, watched him minister, watch him preach, watch him the way he used to eat, the way that he treated women, the way that he treated children, the way that he treated old people. I would have just loved to have sat there. I just watched him, not even sit in it, and just to watch him. But whenever you think about who he was and what the Bible says he was, it's hard for me to imagine that anybody could see him in real life and reject him. Whenever you see who he was, who his character was, if someone would have heard the teaching of Christ directly and saw his impeccable character and the wonderful miracles that he did, surely they would have immediately threw themselves at his feet and worshipped him as Savior and Lord. After all, they were looking in the face of the Son of God. They were looking at God. They were actually looking at God manifested in the flesh. But alas, even many that claimed to be followers of Jesus ended up abandoning him, as we saw in our reading here. That tells me, I know that you might say, well, if Jesus lived in Walt Hill today, everybody would believe. If Jesus lived in Decatur, or Lyons, or, or Norfolk, or wherever you're from this morning, well, if he walked it, if, if only Jesus could walk this earth, they would all believe. It's not true. It's not true. I don't want to just go and look at what, later on, why they didn't all believe him. Because it's quite amazing when you read this here. But let us look at this Jesus this morning and see who he actually was. Let us even look at his name. We mentioned in the name the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does that name mean? Well, the name Lord refers to him being God. It, that was his divine title. The name Jesus refers to him, him being a man. That was his human name. The name Christ refers to him being the Messiah. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. That was what his earthly ministry was all about. And even as you study the Old Testament, you will see that Jesus Christ was predicted, his character, everything about him, where he would live, when he would be born, it is all predicted in the Old Testament. Now remember, the three largest religious, or the, the three main religions in the world, they say is Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The three main religions in the world. Do you know that all three believe in, they purport to believe in the Old Testament? They claim, they, we believe the Old Testament. So I want to have a look at this Old Testament as well this morning. Just to see what it says about Jesus Christ. Does it predict them or are we getting it, are we just getting it out of hand this morning? Do you know that them three religions supposedly cover between 3.5 and 3.9 billion people on this earth. Think about it. That's how many claim to believe in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not saying all of them believe. We know there's many believe or purport to believe in the New Testament. But in that Old Testament, the same Old Testament that Jews and, and Muslims and all types of Christians purport to believe, this is what it says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Jesus Christ is called the Mighty God. It's right here in the scriptures. You know, there's, there's a lot of the cults today. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons don't believe that Jesus was God. Well, my Bible says, and your Bible says, and their Bible says that he's a mighty God. Now, this is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth. I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness a few years ago and they were telling me that Jesus isn't God. So I took them to this passage. Do you know what he said to me? He says, um, it says that he's a mighty God, but he's not the almighty God. Ah. I says, what? I says, well, anyway, he's God. <laughs> he's God. And then I thought for a while, and then I took him to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. This is what it says about our Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Hello? Amen. How do you argue with the book? He's not only the mighty God, but he's also the Almighty God. Amen. Think about it. This little baby that came to this earth, they were looking at God. Absolutely phenomenal. I'm telling you what, this, right from the Old Testament, you can point a Jew or a Muslim to Jesus Christ without even going near the New Testament. Absolutely amazing. Um, but back in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the same scriptures that the Jews and the Muslims say they believe, it says here, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Now, if that's not Jesus Christ, who is it? Yes. It's not Buddha. No. It's not Allah. It's not Muhammad. Who is it but our Lord? Yes. Emmanuel. Okay, you might believe me then. Let's go to Matthew <laughs> chapter 1, verse 23. The Lord's amazing, isn't he? Yes. You know, if you love this book, you'll get excited about it. If you don't love this book, you'll probably not get excited. But these things excite me this morning because this is my Jesus, this is your Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a, sorry, we'll go to verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with, with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. That's who Jesus was. God with us. What a wonderful Jesus this morning. And when you look at him, when you talk to him, you're talking to God. Um, Micah chapter 5 adds further detail to the coming of the Messiah in, in the Old Testament. Again, we're looking at the Old Testament. And it says, Thou Bethlehem, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from of old, from everlasting. He always was and he always will be. Yes, amen. This is Jesus. This is no ordinary man this morning that we're talking about. Jesus Christ is God. Well, I'll give you another fact. Maybe you don't know this, but do you know the very year... When he was going to appear in this earth is actually predicted in the Bible. Yes, yes. The Old Testament prophets, in fact, um, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, the angel Gabriel appears unto Daniel and actually predicts. He says, when this happens, you can count 400, 
it, it talked about uh, 70 weeks, 490 years, but it talked about after 483 years, the Messiah is going to begin his ministry. I mean, that's phenomenal. They actually knew the year. So when, when, when Jesus Christ walked this earth, there was messianic fever. They thought John the Baptist was a Messiah. Huh? They were looking for him. The Jews were looking for this Messiah. The, Israel was looking. I wonder, is he the Messiah? He has to come. Daniel said that he's going to come. And he's going to start. They thought Herod was the Messiah. There was people in the, the New Testament called the Herodians. The Herodians were people that thought Herod was the Messiah. There's others. And John says, I'm not the man, but he is. Amen. Yes. You're looking for the Messiah. There's one coming. I can't even list. I can't even lace his shoes. That's what John said. This is who Jesus was. And he introduced him. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. <coughs> this is the Jesus that we're talking about this morning. Um, so that was in Daniel 9. If you have time later, read from Daniel 9, 21. Right down to the end of, of that chapter 9. But back, back to the New Testament. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I hope you're not getting bored this morning, but no. it's kind of a Bible study and it's a sermon at the one time. Yes. So, but I can tell you, I did not, I didn't know. I, I was talking to Curtis on Friday night, and, and he knows this. I didn't know what I was preaching today. I, I just said, I don't know what I'm preaching. But we we started to, as we were talking, there was things God was kind of laying things in my heart today. And come Saturday, this year just all come together. But I want to go even further. And I remember it was Gabriel that spoke to, to Daniel back in the Old Testament. Well, guess what? When you get into Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Gabriel appears again. This same angel that appeared to Daniel, here he is, coming to say, right, now's the time. Yeah. And here it is. This is. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and the angel came in unto her and said hail thou that art highly favored the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and when she saw him she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be and the angel said unto her fear not Mary for thou hast found favor with God and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. This is incredible stuff. This is incredible stuff. Not only did he fulfill every single Old Testament prophecy regarding him right down to the very letter. Everything that he did came to pass. Everything he prayed was fulfilled. Every command he said was realized. He operated constantly in supernatural power. He turned the water into wine. He walked on water. Whenever there was a storm, he talked to the water and he brought peace. I mean, this is the Jesus. Yeah. Can you imagine to live in that day and watch a storm? And the, in fact... The Bible tells us that they were in the boat. The water was coming over the side of the boat. And he just said, peace, be still. And immediately, the waters, all creation was subject to him. When he said to that water, be wine, it just become wine instantly. He, in his very voice, he was a creator. If, if you had a blue jacket on and he said red, it would go red. And I say that respectfully. That's who he was. He was the creator. This Jesus, I mean, this is absolutely phenomenal. He made the blind see. He made the lame walk. He made the lepers whole. Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain. In Luke 7, 11, 15, she was dead. Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. Luke 8, 41. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. John 11, 1. All this is mighty and confirmed that he was who he said he was. But amazingly, it wasn't enough for many people. Isn't this amazing? He's doing all this, but it wasn't enough. 
How could anybody in their right mind reject this man? How could they do it? Hebrews 5.9 says that he was made perfect. Hebrews 4.15 says he was without sin. 1 John 3.5 says in him it is no sin. 1 John 3.3 says he is pure. In Isaiah 53.11, he says that he was heaven's righteous servant. Hebrews 7.26 says that he was holy. Revelation 22.6 says that he was faithful and true. Basically, everything he said was honest and right. He didn't say a wrong thing or do a wrong thing. As you read the Old Testament, you will, or the New Testament, you will discover that friend and foe alike couldn't find one fault in him. We preached on that a few months ago. Even when he stood found guilty before, before Pilate, he says, I find no fault in this man. Three times. Three times. And they're trying to accuse him. He says, there's no fault in this man. Even the Pharisees send out their, the, the, their officers to try and find a fault. They followed him everywhere. You can imagine them. They couldn't find. They come back and, and they say, we've got nothing on him. There's no way they would never get anything on him. Because he was innocent. He was perfect. He was pure. And just as you read it, it just starts to become alive. And I think you and me need reminded of this. That Jesus we served was God. Amen. He was God. Jesus Christ never put a foot wrong. He was perfection in motion. He was spotless in his character. His words were totally pure. His actions were supernatural. His motives were impeccable. His thoughts were uncontaminated and his nature was completely holy. So how could anyone in their right mind reject him? How could they? You know what God showed me? And if you're writing notes, this is what God showed me yesterday. Because I'm asking this question time and time again. These, these were people who claimed to be disciples of him. They're followers of him. How could they reject him? Do you know what the Holy Ghost showed me? They didn't like his message. They admired him. They didn't like his message. It was one thing to admire this perfect Christ. It was another thing to yield to his demands. Many made decisions for Christ. Maybe when he had a meeting, he would ask them, who wants to give their heart to me? And they put up their hand. Or maybe he did an altar call and he says, if you want to follow me, would you come to the front? Would you just stand here? And maybe the place was packed. And they're saying, I'll follow Jesus. I'll follow this, this <coughs> man who changed water into wine. I'll follow him. Look, he makes the blind to see. I, I'll follow him. Many followed him. There was thousands and thousands and thousands were following him. But when he started to crank it up a gear and said, this is what it is to be a real believer, many ran. Many says, that, that, that's too hard for me. <coughs> they didn't want to pay the cost. They, ha they had to be, there had to be an easier way than <coughs> giving your all to Jesus Christ. They had a religious faith in their head, but it was not a spiritual faith that transforms a life and changes their desires and gives them a power over sin. You see, I talk to many people today, and many say, well, I believe. You stand and give tracks out there at the gas station. <coughs> And you give it out and you ask someone, are they, are, do they believe in God? Everyone, yes, yes. In fact, I'm trying to think, I've maybe met one person down there that said no. Everyone believes. Everyone believes. And the, the sad thing is, we know according to this book, the majority is going to hell. It says it's a few that go to heaven. And as you read this, and I always think of that verse in James 2 verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You can be sure of one thing. The devils know that he's God. But we know where they're going. They're going to the lake of fire. And I'm just saying to know that he's God is not enough. Many have an intellectual belief, one that requires no change of lifestyle. Real biblical faith transforms a man and turns him into a new creature. If you've got the Holy Ghost, 
If you've got Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. You're changed. You're not what you used to be. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 and Colossians 3.10 says a genuine Christian is a new man. A new man. This is what I used to be. This is who I am today. John 3.3 and John 3.7 and 1 Peter 1.23 describes it as being born again. Or if you look at the original Greek, it's been born from above. Born from above. John 1.13, 1 John 2.29. 1 John 3, 9, and there's a few others say that to be a Christian is to be born of God. Romans 6, 4 tells us that the Christian walk is newness of life. It's a new life. Galatians 6, 15 says that we become a new creature. Is this the Christianity you possess? Are you a new creature? What I'm saying is that this is what will get you to heaven. This is the only Christianity that will get you to heaven. Many people say they're a Christian, but they just sin like everybody else. Friend, why get to hell and realize I should have been real? So many people, it's just like, as a pastor, as a preacher, it's like, do people not get it? They excuse sin. And this is where I was, Curtis and me were just talking about, you know, people today is like, oh, there's no harm in drinking and you know, doing this and watching a bit of pornography and whatever. And it's like, that's their flesh. They don't want to die to self. They don't want to become a new creature. I used to live that life. I don't want to live it anymore. I don't want to be stuck in a bar with all that, that, that perverted music and that atmosphere where men are being unfaithful to their wives. And I don't want to be there because I'm a new creature. Yeah. I want to be around God's people. Yeah. Because they're holy. They're, they're, they want to talk about good things. You know, and I know, I'm not stupid. I lived that life for 10 years. I know what happens in the bars. I know the language. Jesus is blasphemed. I don't need to listen to that. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. You're talking about my greatest friend. I don't want to be there. You, you, you hear the dirty jokes and everybody's... <laughs> I don't want to hear the dirty jokes. I used to find them funny. They grieve me today. I don't want to hear about somebody being unfaithful on their wife. Oh, you, you're not going to believe. I, I was out with this woman last week. Five weeks ago, I, I, I was online to this other chick. I don't want to hear that junk. That's sin. Why would a Christian want to be in that environment? There's something wrong. Honestly, there's something wrong. Because a Christian, according to this book, is a new creature. Is a new creature in Christ. And I don't want anything short of what he said. Friend, this is where the rubber makes the road. Jesus knew they all, oh, we will follow Jesus. Oh, he's wonderful. But as you start to study here a little bit, in verse 57, Jesus was basically saying that if you want to be a Christian, you're going to live by what I say, not what you say. That's what he said. You shall live by me. I call the shots now. You don't call the shots anymore. It's me. And I can tell you, everybody wants to follow Jesus until you have to get into the back seat and he drives the car. That's where, that, this is where the rubber meets the road. To be a born again Christian is this. You give him the driver's seat. And you sit in the back seat. And I can tell you what, the journey's worth. <coughs> Even if it's difficult. Amen? Amen. Amen? Even if, whether you're going through bereavement, whether you're going through illness, whether you have been betrayed, whether your husband has run off with another woman, still in that back seat there's peace because he's driving. That's right. Amen. And when I start to wobble like this, I just look at him and I say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be okay. He is not going to take me down a wrong road. I know him. I know his character. I trust him. Lord, just keep driving. It's tough, but it's wonderful. Just to, just to know you as my friend. Just, that's what it is to be a Christian. It's, Jesus said, let a man deny himself. Why do we not preach that anymore? Let a man deny himself. Take up his cross. And follow me. 
It talks about a corn of wheat. It will not bear fruit unless it go into the ground and die. Christianity is about death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. What dies? Self. What is raised up then? Hello? Do you understand? We're buried. That's right. We're buried. So that's why when we did the baptism, I said, let's, let's give your flesh a decent burial. That's what baptism is. We put them under the water. That's you dying. A picture of you dying. When you raised up, it's a new person. Now, if a changed life stops being the evidence of the new birth, then we might as well forget about it. And what I'm saying is in the liberal day that we live in, oh, everything's okay. Oh, I, I was saying to Curtis, there's battles that I'm fighting today as a pastor. 20 years ago, it wasn't even an issue in Christian circles. Oh, well, it's okay for uh, homosexuals to get married as long as they're in a loving relationship. What a load of baloney. Where does that... The Bible says that there is... By the way, that's what the hullabaloo is in our nation today. Because a man said, homosexuality is an abomination to God. I know that it, he said it a lot cruder, and there's things that he said, but what I'm saying is, what he said was, that that is sick, and that's an abomination. And the media went, <laughs> Well, so what? I hope they call me, because I'll tell them the same thing. I wish they would invite me on to CNN. Because I can tell you, Anderson Cooper is not going to intimidate me. He can talk down to whoever he wants, to all these political guys, but I'm going to tell him that the Bible's true. Yes. Thus saith the Lord, it is written, there is no homosexuals in heaven, according to the book. You say, well, I disagree. I don't care whether you disagree. He said it, and he's Amen. right. Let God be true and every man a liar. That means that the whole of America could say it's okay. And if he says it's not, then guess what? Hey, you say, well, that's not love. By the way, I, we have seen homosexuals get saved. We've seen all types of people get saved. Jesus Christ transforms whoever wants to get saved. I am not beaten up on anything. Let me tell you, homosexuality, infidelity, adultery, Drunkenness, God hits it all. But what I'm saying is that's the big issue today. 20 years ago, it wasn't an issue in Christian circles. And this is, pastors are having to fight for the very basics in this book. And if you stand for the book, guess what? You're a fanatic. You've got no love today. Friend, I can tell you what. Anybody that comes into this church is welcome in this church. I pray that we will never, ever discriminate against anybody. I'll tell you a lovely story about David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson was preaching one night, preaching the gospel, real strong message. And there was a transvestite in that service. He was a man, dressed up as a woman, had had the sex change. That just absolutely just looked like a, like a woman, really. Makeup, wig, the whole works. And as he's preaching, this man walked to the front. And fell on his knees and cried out for mercy. Today, he's one of the strongest members in that church. <laughs> Immediately, outwardly, he had had all the sex change, but he was a new creature in Christ. Yes. And you know what David Wilkerson done? He gave him a big hug. Yes. That's my brother today. Yeah. So don't tell me anybody, oh, well, they've had a sex change, they're beyond redemption. A load of baloney. If they hear the truth, anyone, I trust if someone like that came into this church, that you would not move seats and sit somewhere else. No. I don't, if the biggest alcoholic in this area come in, I don't care. It could be someone that is homeless. And you say, you say well, they, 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 they stink, whatever. Well, guess what? What do you think John the Baptist was like? Yeah. He lived, there was no deodorant in that place. <laughs> This man was crying out for deodorant all night on Friday night. And he was complaining to me, I, I had none of that spray deodorant. And he's, but imagine being John the Baptist and living out in a desert. There wasn't any deodorant out there. Huh? If John, John the Baptist sat there, would, would you want to sit beside him? 
Big hairy beard down his belly button? Huh? Hadn't had a shower in probably six months? Huh? But I'll tell you, the anointing of God was upon him. Huh? I'm just saying this, that God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And there's a big difference. We have to stand against sin. That's not, that's not having hatred, that's love. Tell me this, if that man or woman, whatever sin they're in, if they're going to hell and you refuse to speak, <coughs> is that love or, or is that a lack of love? I mean, if you love the person, you'll be a friend. You need to turn from that lifestyle. If you love them. If you love them. And what I'm saying is we need to get back to calling sin, sin, and righteousness, righteousness. This book says there's no drunkards in heaven. He said it. Well, how many drinks do you need to take to be a drunk? Well, I was a police officer in Northern Ireland. Do you know how many drinks it took for our government to say you were drunk? Two drinks. And the, the British government says, when you take two drinks, we consider you are impaired, you're a drunk. It's called DIC over there, drunk in charge. Here it's called DUI. What I'm saying is, I don't know where God's line is or whatever, but even the fact that people would talk like that tells me that their flesh is alive. My, my aim in life is, how, how close can I get to Egypt? I, I want to get so close to Egypt and make it to heaven. No, I want to get as far away from there as I can. And I want to be as close to the promised land as I can. Because the Bible says, flee all appearance of evil. I don't even want to be... I, because if I said to you, well, congregation this morning, I've come to the conclusion, it's okay to take one drink. Now, I asked our youth this. I said... What would you think if you went into, if you were going past that bar, you seen me coming out of there with a tent of Budweiser? What would you think? Do you know what they said? We'd never be back here. And do you know why they said that? Because you would have no credibility. What I'm saying is the preacher has a higher standard again. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is, my, I used to love that Budweiser. I used to love Guinness. That was my life. But whenever I got saved, the things I used to love, I now hate it. Even the smell of it, even the taste of it was like, oh, how did I ever drink that stuff? And I'm not preaching legalism this morning, by the way, because you know, I, it's very rarely I ever touch this subject. I don't even know why I'm touching it this morning. But I know it's something that we talked about. I couldn't shake it off yesterday. And I said, Lord, if you want me to cover it, I'll cover it. These disciples... Disciples said, it's too hard. We, we, you're asking too much. Verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, it's a hard saying. Who can hear it? Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You see, the day we're in, people want a user-friendly, sicker sensitive, lovely jubbly sermon. Don't come, don't offend me in my in my sin. Just leave me the way I am. But every time Jesus opened his mouth, he exposed the flesh and he glorified God. Yes. Your flesh needs offended. My flesh needs offended. Amen? Amen. 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 So don't feel sorry for your flesh this morning. It, it needs exposed. So does mine. Christ wasn't satisfactory enough. They needed something more attractive. They wanted to feed upon their, old, their own carnal desires. Many that profess Christ are consumed by feeding their flesh rather than feeding their spiritual man. The here and now takes preeminence over the eternal. They cannot handle the whole concept of self-denial. That's too much for them. They therefore end up playing church, outwardly doing the religious thing, but inwardly their flesh calls the shots. Think about it. These disciples saw him, they heard him, they recognized him, they liked him, but they rejected him. It's amazing. 
<clears throat> they didn't go away because they didn't like him. They just didn't like his message. The message was too strong. I guarantee you, if we were to bring them same men back this morning from hell, because they followed him no more. If we were to bring all them disciples back that were following him and line them up here, they would plead with every one of us to abandon that lifestyle. They would say, don't go there. We did it and look what we ended up. If we could just bring one man from hell this morning, I'm telling you what, he would make me look like a liberal preacher. He would be pleading. He would be shaking. You say, listen, give your all to Jesus Christ. He is God. He's the way. He's worth living for. He's worth dying for. He's everything. He's the son of God. He's God, a very God, but he's also man, a very man. And by the way, the reason why he reaches out and gives us a hard message, a strong message, because he loves us. He loves each of us this morning. I love what it says about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused. He didn't want to be associated with Egypt. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin <coughs> for a season. There's pleasure in sin. Don't let anybody... Don't let anybody tell you there's no pleasure in, in sin. There's a lot of pleasure in sin. The Bible says it. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin. But Moses said, I do not want to just taste the pleasures of sin for a season. And trade that for all eternity, worshiping my God. He wouldn't even call himself an Egyptian. Wouldn't even call himself that. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Basically, Jesus Christ was everything. Moses was looking forward and said, Do you know what? It's worth it. If he is going to pay for all my sin, then I'm going to live for him. I'm going to serve him. And today, the question is the same today as it was back 2,000 years ago. Are you willing to surrender all to him? Are you willing to get in the back seat and let him drive the car? It hasn't changed. Some will say yes. Some will say no. In fact, Jesus talked about the 25%. He says of the four people that hear the word of God and receive the word of God, there's only one of them that bears fruit. They all receive. So they sit in a meeting like this. They all hear the word. They say, yes, I believe it. But out of the, that 100%, 25% of them bear fruit. And I've talked to preachers over the years. And if you ask a preacher, a preacher that's a real McCoy, and you say, out of all those that have made decisions for Jesus over your ministry, how many of them have ended up going through for Jesus? Do you know what most of them say? Around 25%. It's the same here. I would say, out of everyone that has made a decision for the Lord here, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I need Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. Everybody wants their sins forgiven, but nobody wants to die itself. Out of that, I'm not saying there could be 24%, there could be 20 I don't know. I'm just saying, I would say 25 there's 75% of them are doing their own thing. They're out doing their own thing today. It's always been like that. I want to be a part of the 25%. Yes, yes. Jesus said four type of crime. Read it when you get home. But there's only one of them made heaven. Yes, Our responsibility is not to save anybody. It's just to tell the truth. And I can tell you, my prayer is this. Lord, I pray that nobody will end up in hell because of me. Amen. Because I didn't tell them the truth. I, you know, my heart is to tell you the truth. Even if it's difficult... Even if it's painful for you, because I want to see you make heaven. I want everybody here this morning to make heaven. As I close, what sin is holding you back? What sin is it that's stopping you bearing fruit? What is it that's so big 
that will stop you surrendering everything to him and living for him. What is it? What is it that this life has to offer that stops you being totally surrendered? What is it? I can tell you there's always a big one. There's a big obstacle. And this big obstacle, well, you know, I would live for Christ. But, but this. It could be another, it could be a relationship. It could be a sin. It could be a temptation. I don't know what it is. But I can tell you what. God's will for your life is that we die, we're buried, and we're rose in Christ. When people see us, they see Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Amen. Die to self. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ that liveth in me. And if you check that out in the Greek language, and the New Testament was written in Greek, that word I in the Greek is the word ego. Ego. The Greek word for I is ego. Ego. Ego is what takes people to hell. Jesus Christ is what takes people to heaven. He either drives the car or you drive the car. By the way, you know who's driving the car. Don't, don't say, well, I'm not sure. I mean, hello, you tell me when you're driving and he's driving, you both go to the same places. Be honest. These are all very quiet this morning. Aren't they? When you're driving the car, do you go to the exact same places as when Jesus is driving the car? No. When you're driving, where do you go? <coughs> when he's driving, where does he take you? Where you need to go. There's a big, big difference. And sometimes we, well, I'm not sure. Or I ask people and say, are you born again? Well, I'm not sure. It's like, <coughs> I mean, hello, if Jesus lives in there, how can you not know? I mean, the, your desires change. You're a new creature. And I'm not here to condemn anyone this morning because you know what? He came to save. He didn't come to condemn. But I want... I want to challenge you. What is it that's holding you back from giving your all to the Lord? Jesus asked a question to the disciples. I think this is what he said. When, when they all started to murmur and complain, he says, does this offend you? Are you offended by my words? Are you offended this morning? He says, are you offended? And then he turned around to the, the real disciples, the ones that, were, that really had it in their heart. And he says, you can imagine, I don't think it was easy for Jesus to see them, this crowd just leaving. Can you imagine you know, most of your congregation just getting up and walking out? I, it would break my heart. I, I couldn't speak. I would, just be, I would be at that altar weeping. Just to see the, the whole congregation get up and say, too hard. We, we, we can't live that. We respect you, Jesus, but we're not prepared to die to self. So they all, they all got up, but there was a few here. They were standing here, and I don't know, he, uh, uh, Jesus had feelings. He wept, he was sorrowful, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he had desires. I don't think he was bulletproof. I believe as he's standing there hurting, hurting at them, turning, all he seen was their backs. As they all walked away, turning their backs on him. He just turned around to the other and said, will, will you, will you, I'll, I'll quote it exactly, I don't want to quote, paraphrase it. Will ye also go away? Are you going to go as well? But you know what Peter said? Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure. We believe and we are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the Christian. I know he is who he says he is. I'm not hoping that I chose the right one out of all these gods. I'm not going, I hope I chose, chose the right one. I know he is the Son of God. Yes. I can show to any Jew or any Muslim that the Messiah they're looking for, he's already come. And he's coming again very soon. But 
The problem when you talk to human beings is not, do you respect Jesus? Even the Muslims say he was a prophet. The Muslims will not completely trash Christ. They might trash us, but they'll say he was a prophet. He wasn't Messiah, but he was a prophet. The big problem. This is what sorts out the men from the mice. Will you surrender all to him? The genuine Christian will do anything for him. The phony is too hard. I, 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 can't, I can't live that life, Paul. People tell me that. They say, Paul, I've tried it, but I can't. Have you ever heard that? I, I've tried to be a believer. I can't do it. And they just turn their back on Jesus. Let us bow our heads and pray.